Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? That is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went out in, into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But his eyes is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto disobedient and gainsaying people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have this morning to gather in your house. Lord, I pray that you would please just um, bless everyone here this morning. God, help me to, to find the right words to preach this message. God, I pray that you will... Um, Help me only to, to preach those things that are right and that are true and that um, <clears throat> you'll just uh, bless our hearts. Help us to understand what's being preached this morning. God, help me to, to really teach this message. And um, Lord, I pray that you please help our hearts to be free from distraction. And um, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Romans chapter 10 here is a... Excuse me, a very popular passage of scripture, and it, and it gives us the, the way that people essentially get saved. It starts off with the Apostle Paul saying, you know, it's my desire to God that, that Israel be saved. He wants his kinsmen to be saved. He cares for his, his physical brethren, the physical seed of Israel. He, he, he says, I have this yearning, I have this desire, I want these people to be saved. I really want them to be saved, but they're stuck. They're, 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 they think salvation is based on works. They're, they're stuck in, the, in, this, in this bad religion, and they, and they don't understand. They're, they're ignorant of God's righteousness. They think they can establish their own righteousness, and that living a good life is going to get them saved and get them to heaven, but they don't realize that salvation is a free gift. And he goes on to explain how it happens. He's saying it's so easy. You know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's so simple, yet they don't get it. They're not receiving it. And he goes on to explain here later in the chapter in verse number 14, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Because it's so easy. All you got to do is call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says anyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you say, well, how is that going to happen? How are people going to call on the name of the Lord? You know, it's not like these people that say, uh, you know, I've heard people say that, Oh, these people living in Africa, they, they are really seeking God and they just look up and just, and just say, you know, some prayer to God and they say, that person's saved. No, they're not. If they haven't heard of Jesus Christ, if they don't know the name of Jesus, then they're not saved. That's right. What are they putting their faith in if they just look up and say some prayer because they're seeking who God is? Okay, not everyone that just wants to know who God is is just automatically saved because they make a prayer. They need to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what he says here. How shall they call on him? See, they're not able to call that, that, that lost tribesman in Africa is not able to call on the Lord if he hasn't heard. He says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Right? First of all, he has to believe. And how shall he believe in him of whom they have not heard? You have to hear about it. In order to believe anything, you have to hear about it first. Amen. You don't just come up with things on your own. If you, you want to believe something... You, do, you know, you have to hear about, especially about Jesus Christ, the Bible, you have to have heard about it in order to believe it. You have to believe it in order to call on him, and you need to call on him in order to get saved. It says, and how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach 
The gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This is why we're so strong on soul winning. This is why our church is all about soul winning. This is why we, we you know, need to go out and everybody here under the sound of my voice needs to understand how important this is. People are not going to be calling on God on their own and getting saved and going to heaven unless there's people being sent, unless they're, they're hearing about Jesus, unless they're hearing the gospel message, unless people are being sent to preach that message and people are, are hearing that message in order to believe it, in order to call on God and get saved. Amen. It is a necessity. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That is where your faith comes from. It comes from the Word of God. We need preachers to be preaching the Word of God. I'm going to be teaching a little bit on soul winning this morning. And the title of my sermon is A Proper Soul Winning Attitude. Now, I just wanted to lay that foundation. It's, it's, it's so important. I don't think I'm never going to stop preaching this. And it, it may seem to many of you, though, that's real basic. I've heard this before, but we need to keep uh, strong on this. We can't let this go by the wayside. It needs to be at the forefront of our minds, the importance of going out and preaching the gospel and just reiterating, just showing you over and over again, look, this is so important. If we don't do this work, people aren't going to be getting saved. And what I'm going to be talking about is really it's kind of a, for most of you that do go out soul winning, hopefully this will help you to fine tune your approach. If you've never been out soul winning before, this is still good wisdom and knowledge to learn and to understand and to have with you. Um, but it's, it's the attitude that we have. It's the attitude that we carry. The way that we present ourselves when we're given the gospel is what I'm going to be covering this morning. What is your attitude like? And I, I've gone out soul winning with many different people. I love going out soul winning with different people. I love hearing someone else give the gospel. I love seeing the things that they do. And every time there's things where I'm learning from and thinking, wow, I never thought of explaining things that way. Or, oh, wow, that's pretty new. Oh, they're using that verse. That's a great verse. I want to use that next time too and kind of incorporate things that other people do. But oftentimes too, there are also some things where I think, well, this could be done better. That could be done better. And um, as a result of a lot of my experience, uh, the way that we present ourselves and the attitude that we have when we speak with people is actually extremely important in even getting somebody to listen to you. Now, the first attribute I want to talk about, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6, here in Romans 10. Flip forward to Ephesians chapter 6. The first thing that should characterize your attitude as a soul winner, as someone who's going to preach the gospel, is boldness. We need to have a bold attitude because if you don't have boldness, how are you even going to preach the gospel at all? You have to be bold enough to open up your mouth and breach the subject of religion. You have to be bold enough to, to be willing to talk about Jesus Christ and actually open up your mouth and say these things that the society is going to tell you, the world's going to tell you, don't talk about religion. Oh, that's going to make people uncomfortable. And even experience will tell you. Oh, I brought up Jesus before and everyone just got real quiet and, and, and it was real awkward, right? It happens, which is why you need boldness. Because normally people want to shy away when, when, when you're in an awkward situation. You kind of want the awkwardness to just go away, right? You want things to just go back to being comfortable and being normal. Well, guess what? If you're going to be preaching Jesus, you got to be ready for the awkwardness. You got to be ready for it just to, be, to, to get people a little uncomfortable and not let that bother you. Because you got to understand what, what's more important to you. The comfort of a person right now, today, or tomorrow, and, and, and however their day is going, beautiful weather, and, and let them be comfortable and not give them the gospel and let their soul just go to hell when they die so they could burn for eternity or deal with a little bit of awkwardness, deal with a little bit of, of you know, someone being maybe a little bit put off so that at least they could hear the gospel and have the chance to get saved. And that, and that maybe then from that day forward, their entire eternity could be changed from going to hell to going to heaven. I think that little bit of awkwardness, I, look, I appreciate the awkwardness. <laughs> when I got saved, hearing about Jesus Christ, when I was uncomfortable hearing about the things of God, hey, I'm really glad that I heard those things. Amen. I'm really glad that there was a preacher that was able to give me the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm really thankful for that. 
I don't care how uncomfortable it was for me at the time, I would go through that a million times over to have salvation, to have eternal life. We need to realize how important this is. It starts with making the decision and say, this is important. It's, it may be uncomfortable for me, it may be uncomfortable for them, but I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to preach it. And the way that we're going to do that is with boldness. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 1, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. A lion is not timid. A lion, a lion is not, um, you know, backing off. A lion's ready to attack, right? The lion prowls around and he's, and he's in charge. He's the king of the jungle, right? Lion walks around like I own this place. That's boldness. We want to have the boldness where we can walk up and down the streets going, we got this. We're going to go, we're going to speak to every person that I see. I don't care if they're walking their dog. I don't care, you know, we're going to knock on their doors and we're going to preach this gospel. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not going to, going to hide what I believe. We're going to share what I believe. We're going to have the boldness. We're going to preach to people. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 18. The Bible says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The Apostle Paul, he's asking for prayers. He's in jail. He's an ambassador in bonds. That's what it means. In bonds means he's shackled up. He's in prison for doing exactly what he's doing, for preaching the gospel, for being a soul winner, for going out and being a missionary. He is thrown into jail, but he's asking for prayers. He's saying, look, I, I want you to pray for me. I need strength. I want to make sure that, that I don't stop preaching the gospel. He says, I, I need boldness. I want to be able to open up my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He said that there I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's how I ought to be doing it. I ought to be speaking the truth in boldness and, and in confidence, knowing that what I'm saying is true, knowing that I've got the, the plan of salvation. I've got the true gospel. I've got the truth from the Bible to preach unto the world. You have that confidence. You have that boldness. There's going to be a lot of attacks. There's going to be a lot of awkwardness. There's going to be a lot of people coming at you and wanting to get you to stop preaching. God, try to get you to, to stop doing what you're doing. But with the boldness, pray for boldness for yourself. Pray for others to have boldness. And it, it's something, if you're going to be a, an effective soul winner, we need to have. And that needs to be part of our attitude going out is having this boldness. Don't get scared off or feel ashamed when people yell at you or make you feel like you're doing something wrong. It happens from time to time. It doesn't happen every time we go out soul winning, but every once in a while you run across somebody who's going to tell you, hey, and this just happened recently with some of the guys here, hey, Granville's a no soliciting area. You're not, you, you can't be going around and doing this, right? If you don't have any boldness, you might just tuck tail and run. But see, then you're going to be listening to man rather than God. God's the one that said, preach the gospel to every creature. God's the one that's saying, I'm sending you out. God's the one saying, I have committed unto you the ministry of reconciliation. You're the one that needs to go out and preach the gospel to people. So if someone says, oh, well, there's no soliciting here. We're not selling anything anyways. We're trying to point you to a free gift. It's the exact opposite of selling something. You need boldness to not let people scare you off. Don't worry about the threatenings. Apostle Paul went all the way to jail for it. And he's still saying, man, I want more boldness because I need to keep doing this. They're not going to stop me, even, though, even if they throw me into prison for it. Even if it is illegal. I don't care. Even if they do pass a law that says you can't go to door to door and you can't be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to do it anyways. Why? Because we obey God rather than men. Turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Acts 4.29 reads, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. You read the book of Acts, there was a lot of persecution. There was a lot of enemies attacking them and trying to get them to stop. A lot of the unbelieving Jews were just following the apostles around and just trying to get them to shut up, trying to get them thrown into prison and just coming after them. And 
That's why in, in Acts 4.29 it says, Lord, behold, they're threatening. They're threatening us. You know, the, the, the chief rulers, the, the, the chief priests, they're coming after us. They're arresting us. They're beating us. They're throwing us into prison. God, behold their threatenings and grant unto us, thy servants, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. In the face of all this persecution. Now, we don't have that much persecution these days. We don't. We need to be ready in case it does come in our lifetime, in case it does get stronger, in case it does really happen upon us the way that it did in the book of Acts. We need to be ready for it. But in any case, we need to have the boldness. Always, always need to have the boldness. Now, our attitude. Yes, we need boldness. I just spent quite a bit of time making sure we need the boldness. But let's not let that boldness translate into other things that we don't need. So what do I mean by that? One of the things is that we're not there. When we go out soul winning, we're not there to start fights or to win arguments. We're not out trying to debate people. You can be very bold in a debate, but that's not the goal. What we need boldness for is to preach the word of God, to preach salvation unto people. The goal when we go out is to win. So we go out soul winning. The goal is to win souls, right? So that's what the name is called, soul winning. We're winning souls to Christ. We're not out trying to prove a heretic why he's wrong. I mean, you want to show them the, the, the gospel. You want to show them what the Bible says as far as being saved goes. But we're not going to spend all afternoon arguing with some Jehovah's false witness or some Mormon that's just stuck in their ways and stuck in religion. They don't want to hear what you have to say and they don't have a repentant heart about the gospel. Leave them be. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 23. The Bible reads, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Strifes is fighting. So he's saying, foolish... And unlearned can, can be kind of translated. It's a nice way of saying stupid questions, okay? Unlearned, ignorant. You know, people might be asking you some questions about, uh, about the Bible, and they're just really ignorant. Avoid that stuff. You don't want to get off on some rabbit trail of some ignorant question that people just, just have no clue on. And um, continue trying to give them the gospel, but... Don't get caught up into these foolish line of questioning. You know, people, it, it happens. Anyone who goes out soul knows it happens. You're trying to stay on the gospel. You're trying to show them, you know, how to be saved. And then they just bring up something way off the wall. Just, just completely out there. Well, you know, what do you think about aliens? Well, is there aliens in the Bible? What do you, you know, can, are we really just the only thing that God created and really just want to go in on that? Or do you even know what the name of God is? Do you even know what his name is? These are the th and, and they want to get you down that path. You want know, to avoid that. Avoid it. One of the ways that I avoid it is to say, you know what, we can talk about that later, but right now let's just focus on, on, on this, what I'm trying to show you about being saved. We can deal with all that stuff later and just kind of pass it, pass it on down the road a little bit. And if they won't give it up, then you know what? The other way to avoid it is say, okay, I'll have you see you have a, a nice day. Because you're not going to get anyone saved talking about whether or not Adam or Eve had a belly button. Or whether aliens exist or any of these other things. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. So he's saying a lot of these, these foolish questions, though, they could turn into fights. They turn into arguments. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. So these are good qualities. Look, we're talking about our attitude that we have. When you're going out soul winning, it's, it's also important to make sure... You're there to teach them the gospel. You're trying to be apt. It means your ability to teach. You want to be patient with the person that you're talking to. I mean, the whole point you're there is because you love them. You don't want them to go to hell. You want them to go to heaven. So part of that love is going to be, be a little patient with them. You know, if they're not getting things, they don't understand. Maybe they are saying some dumb things. That's okay. I mean, don't get caught up and fight and argue over it. But be patient with them trying to show them the, the, the gospel. Verse number 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. When we go out and teach, first of all, you know, you are the teacher. We're not there to be taught. 
every once in a while you run across somebody who, who thinks that they're really knowledgeable about the scripture and about Bible and about doctrine and all this other stuff, and they want to tell you, right? You show the door and they want to tell you what's right. They want to tell you how to be saved. That's not why we're there, okay? Now, you could still be humble. You could be polite, but you're not there to be taught. We are there to preach the gospel. We are there to win souls, and especially if it's evident that their soul is not saved, don't let, them, don't let the other person control the conversation. You know, hopefully, the, the goal is to actually have a conversation. The goal is to get input. It's not just to preach in their face and just have them sit down, shut up, and I'm just going to tell you what's right. Engaging people in conversation is what we want, but you are supposed to be the one leading the conversation and leading them down the, the, the path to, to let them understand that they're a sinner. Let them understand that there's a punishment for their sins. Let them understand that there's a Savior. Let them understand what it is that they need to do to be saved, conversing with them the whole way through and making sure they're getting it and kind of showing them these truths of the Bible. We're not there to be taught, but what you are doing is you're teaching. You are showing them what they need to understand and what they need to learn. You're not there to be taught. However, it's to be done, as you're teaching, it's to be done with humility. Nobody likes talking to an arrogant person. You could have a lot of knowledge. You could have a lot of wisdom. But the way that you speak to people is going to determine whether or not they're going to listen to you. You could have all the wisdom and all the knowledge in the world. And, and 1 Corinthians 13 says, that I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You could have all wisdom, all knowledge, everything, but if you're going around puffed up, Mr. Know-it-all, I know, you know, you just need to listen to me. I know way better than you, you know, and you have that type of an attitude, you're not going to be getting very many people saved because no one's going to want to listen to you. We don't want to be an arrogant jerk. We want to show people be humble, okay? When someone says something that may be stupid, you don't laugh at them and, and call them stupid and berate them. You meekly and humbly Show, you know, you could say, oh, well, I don't think that's true because the Bible says this, you know, here's, and, and, and divert to, to the scripture being the authority, not yourself. This is where the true wisdom comes from anyways. We need to have meekness. Meekness means you're not lifting yourself up. You know, it, it's funny when you get these people that just want to debate. You see it a lot on, on like YouTube and Facebook, you know, people wrote these comments and they'll say things like, well, I've got my bachelor's in theology and I'm studying, you know, I've been studying for eight years and they, they want to throw all of these other accolades out there as to why you need to listen to me. As opposed to saying meekly and humbly, I'm just a messenger. My own personal, however, wherever I'm at spiritually, wisdom, look, if it's what the book says, this is what we care about anyways. I don't care if it's my seven-year-old daughter trying to show you salvation. If she's got it right and she's using God's word, that's all you need. Because it's not her. It's not you. It's not me. It's God. It's Jesus. And it's, and it's, and it's right here. So don't make it. And look, praise God. I, I want you all to be very well learned. And I'm going to cover this a little later. This is something that should, people should know about our church is that our church members know the Bible very well. We ought to know the Bible very well. We ought to be able to, to get, provide people with answers from Scripture. We ought to know what the Bible says. We ought not to be stumbling and fumbling around when someone asks you a question or when someone challenges you on something. You ought to be able to respond to that. We ought to know the Bible well, but know it well in humility. Be able to teach meekly and not being all puffed up about it. It's easy to get puffed up. I've seen it happen so many times. I think the most common scenario where I've seen people get puffed up is young single guys that learn a lot in a short period of time because maybe they've spent a bunch of time in churches that weren't doing any feeding, that they were, they're real lame and there's hardly anything being taught. All of a sudden, this could happen. It doesn't have to be a young single guy, but that just seems to be the most common. It could be anybody. You get so used to going to these churches, you're not really hearing anything, you're not being fed. All of a sudden, 
You come across them preaching, man, you're learning, you're growing, you're getting stuff down. I mean, you're, you can't even hear it fast enough. And now all of a sudden you just feel like, wow, I've got all this knowledge. And I hear time after time people saying, oh man, my pastor, you was so stupid. And, you know, and his brain goes, look, your old pastor might have had a problem with, with not preaching what he should have been preaching. But it doesn't make him stupid. You know, you don't want to be tearing other people down and start getting puffed up and having this attitude and thinking, I could do a way better job than him and, you know, and all this other stuff after you've been saved and, and hearing preaching for a few months, right? For six months. You got a long ways to grow if that's the case. Stay excited when you hear good preaching. Get, you'll get the wisdom and knowledge. It's great. It's learn. But be humble. You have to stay humble. Otherwise, nobody's going to want to talk to you and no one's going to want to listen to you. You're not going to be effective with that knowledge. Turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Actually, you know what? No, turn if you go to Jude. I'm just going to read this for you. Turn if you go to Jude, the book of Jude, right near the end of the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. That'll help keep you down a little bit. You think you know something? You know, according to the Bible? Yeah. You don't. <laughs> you think you know anything? You don't know anything at all. But um, he says, knowledge puffs up a charity. What is charity? Charity is a special kind of love. It comes from the root word of, of caring. When you care for someone else, you're showing them charity. It's not just donating money. You want to donate money to someone. It can be charitable. You could be giving someone money because you care for them and you're trying to help them out. But it's not just about giving money. Charity has a lot more to do with your love for them and your intentions for them and caring for them. You could have a lot of knowledge, but if you just use it for yourself, you're just puffing yourself up, you just want everyone to know how smart you are, that doesn't do anybody any good. It's just going to turn people off. But when you have charity, what does it do? It edifies other people. What does, it, what does edify mean? You're building them up. You're using your knowledge to build them up, to help them out, to better them in some way. And when we preach the gospel, the way that we're edifying other people is by giving them the truth so that they could be saved so that their soul doesn't have to go to hell. That's some pretty good edification right there. Another attribute that we ought to have, the attitude. We need to have boldness. We need to, to, to be smart and be ready to teach, but not be arrogant, not be proud, have a humble attitude. We also need to be personable. Now, Everybody is going to be at their own stage in their growth and their experience and their skill at soul winning. Soul winning is not a gift that's only given to certain people, by the way. Everyone's commanded to do this. We need to, if, if you're not very good at speaking to people, you need to work at it to get better. Consider that a very important priority for you. I've told this story in the past many times. People who, who know me, most people, I don't think anyone here other than maybe my wife has known me like outside of church, like before I even got into a good church, before uh, I started learning and growing and being a soul winner and doing all this other stuff. I was not a very personable guy. I wasn't a people person. I wasn't good at just approaching someone and having a conversation with them. In fact, even with, with a lot of my friends, I never really said a whole lot. I was kind of quiet, kind of shy. That was my personality. Boy, how things change. <laughs> But if that's the way you are, look, that's fine. Everyone needs to start somewhere. But you need to work on that. We want to be more personable at the door when we're talking to people. You want to keep people interested. You want to, keep them, you want to be able to talk to them in order to give them the gospel. We don't want to make it sound like we're just reading off of a script. Now, I say that because if you are new to soul winning and if that's the way that you're doing it right now because that's just where you're at, then do it. So I'm not saying not, look, if you have to have everything kind of written down, do it, okay? Get started, but don't stay stuck there. Have the goal of saying, I'm going to be transitioning from having to have everything written down and sounding very monotone and kind of just making sure I get through this because you're uncomfortable. And I've been there. I get it. I know what it's like. You, you, you could get very nervous, you get very flustered, and you're just thinking like, man, I just want to make sure I get all these verses out there. And you know what? The power is in God's word. It truly is. However, you're going to still be able to reach more people 
the more you, you, you know, the, the more you could grow and get better at, at speaking with people. You will be able to reach more people and we want to try to be personable. You know, when you sound like you're just reading off a script, you sound like a salesman that's just reciting something. And you know what? Maybe some people will listen to you and some people will even get saved. But that's not where we want to stop. We want to keep growing. We want to be able to, to have a conversation. And that's again, back to the conversation board. You're speaking to them and listening to what they say back to you. Yes, you have a goal in your head on where you're going to go to and the verses you're going to use and how you're going to explain things to them, but you're still having a conversation. There's still a real person. It's not just, don't just like not care about what they're saying at all, right? I mean, we're caring about these people. We have charity towards them. And don't have an attitude or mock when people have a false doctrine or don't know something, right? Maybe there is someone who thinks they're extremely spiritual, right? They're opposing themselves, as the Bible says. You know, we need to, to instruct those that oppose themselves because they think they might know everything and you know that they don't, but it's not going to do them any good to just berate them, right? We, we want to be able to meekly just show them, hey, well, have you thought about this? You know, and try to, to, to get these ideas across to them that, um, you know, and the more knowledge that you have, the more you'll be able to kind of add, you know, give something to them to, to consider, to think about that maybe they're wrong. And also, don't get offended when someone criticizes you, right? So part of being personable and, and being able to talk with people is being uh, patient with them when they're wrong or they're asking stupid questions. And also, when they come and then just criticize you and say, no, you're working for the devil, you were, you know, don't get offended at that. Don't think you have to just automatically turn around and then start cursing them out and stuff. It's fine. Okay? You never know. And, and you know, some people, like I, I've even had this happen before. Someone trying to curse you out because they think you're a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> before you even get up to the door because you're, you're, you're dressed nicely, you're carrying a Bible, and you're going two by two or whatever, and they're just used to JWs coming to their door. We want to make sure that we're able to, to you know, at the very least, you know, if someone cur you know, tries cursing you out, you know, bless them. Just, you know, not, you know, just, just say like, hey, well, we're just, we're just inviting people to Baptist church. You know, like I always try to make sure they know at least we're Baptist. If they continue to curse you out, okay, fine. Well, have a good day, right? Fine. No sweat off your back. You don't need to, to answer cursing for cursing. You don't need to just, just bite back at them. Let them, if, they, if that's the way they're going to be, then, then let them be. We'll, we'll move on to somebody else. Now, also pay attention to the personality. You're in Jude, right? Pay attention to the personality of the person that you're speaking with. Everybody's a little bit different. Everyone teaches a little bit different. Everyone receives things a little bit different. And this is, this is what's great about how like in our, in our independent fundamental Baptist movement, this new movement that we have of, of a lot, you know, pre preachers being sent out, everybody's different. Everybody has a different teaching style. Everybody's got their own strengths and weaknesses. Everybody's different. And people relate to different people, some better, some more. You know, I've heard people saying, you know, my favorite pastor, Pastor Romero, you know, I, I love him. He's the, I think he's the, the greatest. Great. Amen. That's great. You, you know, these people really connect with him and they understand the way he's preaching. You know, other people, man, Pastor Man, you know, he's the best, you know, that's awesome. And, and there are different people like that and their styles fit to different people. Well, the same way when you go out soul winning, there's people that uh, learn different, that understand things a little bit different and that need things a little bit different. And we need to, as you grow, and this is a little bit more advanced maybe in soul winning, is pay attention to who you're talking to. Is the person really quiet? Are they really loud? Are they, you know, like, like what, are their, what are their attributes as, as, as a personality to kind of gear the way that you speak to them to be on their level, to be communicating with them the way that they're going to understand you? And, um, you know, obviously the gospel is the same for everyone. The scripture is the scripture, right? Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the same. It doesn't change for anybody. But the way that you talk to a person, just your mannerisms, the things that you say outside of, of showing them the scripture matter and it's going to make a different impact on different people. How you speak to the person you're giving the gospel to can change. 
Look at verse 22 in Jude. The Bible reads, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You might run across someone who says, oh man, you know, my mom just died. Right? And I'll tell you what, when there's a death, a close, a death of a close relative in a family, and you go and talk to that person out soul winning, that is a prime time for that person to receive the gospel and get saved. They're thinking about mortality. They're thinking about their loved one. They're thinking about the reality of death. Most people are kind of just going about day to day. You're not thinking about dying. Right? I mean, most people aren't. But when there's a death in the family, that's what they're thinking about. But guess what? They're sad. They're grieving. They're mourning. You don't want to come off hellfire and brimstone necessarily with a person like that. You want to come showing them compassion, making a difference, right? And, and showing them, and hey, this is how easy it would have been for you. you know, if you're, all they had to do was put their faith in Christ and they're in heaven. Because a lot of people wonder what, what happened to my, to my relative. But I try to steer away from that a little bit just in case like they're just like, you know, because no one wants to think about the relative in hell. And just, you know, gently, humbly show them the gospel and, and how they can still be together with their other family members and things like that in heaven by, by receiving the gospel. But then other people, they may be a little bit more proud. They may be a little bit more um, thinking that everything's going fine. They may need to be saved with fear. They need a little fear of God. Look, we all need a little fear of God. We, we, part, part of understanding the gospel is understanding that you're a sinner and that you deserve hell. Some people don't even believe they, they, they deserve hell. Well, we need to save those people with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Because whether they understand it or not, that's where they're headed unless they put their faith in Jesus Christ. We need to make sure they understand that and spend enough time saying, hey, you know, a person like that, God's a judge. You've done wrong. You've broken his law. You deserve hell. So you see how there's different situations with people. Now, same Bible, ultimately same gospel message, but the way that you approach someone and the attitude that you have with them is going to vary depending on who you're speaking to. Okay, and these are the types of things that you need to be paying attention to. Turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. These are the things that you want to be paying attention to to help you to grow and become a better soul winner. If you're at the stage where you're just making sure you don't miss any verses and getting through it, fine. But the goal is going to be you want to keep growing and getting better to, to, to be able to pay attention to these things and to really reach people and get through to them and having that right attitude. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Again, strong words about preaching the gospel. I was well saying, look, I don't have anything to glory of when I preach the gospel because necessity, it means it's needful. I have to do this. And actually, if I don't preach the gospel, woe unto me. Because God has given me that job to do. He's saying, I, I, need, I need to be doing I better be doing this. Woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Verse 17, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So he's saying, look, if I willingly will preach God's word, preach the gospel, God's going to reward me for that. So that's good things. That's a good incentive to go out and preach the gospel as a positive, thing, as a positive benefit, as a positive reward to receive good for that. But... If against my will, he says, you know what? The dispensation of the gospel is committed. God's already committed unto me the job of preaching the gospel. It's my duty. It's something I need to do anyways, and woe unto me if I don't do it. Verse number 18, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. So now he's going about, he's going to talk about how he's become all things to all men. They might by all means save some. And this ties in with what I was just talking about, about relating to the person. You have the person who's grieving. You have a person who's proud. You have someone else who, with the Apostle Paul, it's a lot easier for him to relate to people who were Jews, who are of that faith. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee before he got saved. 
So he knows where they're coming from. He can try to reach them using maybe some other scriptures and pointing them to the truth wherever their stumbling block is and attacking that area because, hey, they're Jews. They're trusting in their works. Let's, let me show them that all these sacrifices that they're relying on, that actually doesn't save them at all. It was the blood of the, of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that's going to save them. To the Jews I became as Jews, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. So he's approaching these people, wherever they're at, trying to speak like them and be like them. But, but he says here, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. He's saying, I'm only going to go so far, right? As I um, try to reach people and, and, and try to reach them at their level, I'm, I'm never, you know, it's like you're not going to, you shouldn't be walking into a strip club to preach the gospel. All right. We're still under the law to God. You don't have to go into certain areas and certain wicked, sinful places you never should be stepping foot in to preach the gospel. Wait till they come out at the very least. I mean, if you're, if you're going to do anything, stand on the sidewalk away from, I wouldn't even be close to those places, to be honest with you. I don't think, I don't think you should have any, you, anything to do with them because you know what? All those people have houses, which is why we go and preach the gospel door to door. We'll reach them there. And if they don't have a house, then preach to the, to the homeless people on the street, but not at the strip club. Okay? They're, they're probably, if they're homeless, they're probably not going to be wasting all their money in those, in those wicked places anyways. But um, so he's saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not without the law of Christ. Obviously, there's a limit of, of what you're going to do. But in general, you're going to try to reach people. Hey, if you have an acquaintance and they like going bowling or something or doing, you know, some hobby like that, you go out with them but preach the gospel to them, right? Try to get on their level, whatever it is that, that you can use to, to get in and be able to speak to them about Christ, do it. Verse 22, to the weak became I as weak. Oh, you're having these problems? Well, I have these problems too. I, you know, I'm relating with them. That I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. It's all for the gospel's sake. We want to increase our aptitude and our, and our abilities of soul winning and to be able to reach as many people as possible. We need to be paying attention to who we're speaking with and really trying to get, and look, how are you going to know who the weak are and those that are under the law and, you know, unless you're communicating with them and conversing with them and, and hearing them where they're coming from in order to, to talk to them. When I talk to people doors, people say, oh, I go to Presbyterian church. Oh, you know what? I grew up Presbyterian. That's how I was raised. Brother Spencer saying, you know, people are Catholic. Oh, I was, I was, you know, born and raised in the Catholic Church. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep, I did this. I did this. You know, we did these things. And, and you could point out even some things. It's kind of funny how they, you know, have all these idols in the church, isn't it? You know, and the Bible says not to do that. And you can kind of relate to those people in those ways specifically to show them, you know, where their errors are or whatever and, and, and to get through to them and preach the gospel. All these various things we want to be paying attention to and have part of our attitude, ultimately an attitude of caring for them, an attitude of boldness, an attitude of being able to teach, being humble in our teaching, and being personable in communicating with somebody to where the awkwardness goes away. You're having a good conversation with somebody now. Because once the subject's breached, you can make that awkwardness go away by just... It's there. It's out in the open now. Well, we're just talking about it. So let's keep moving forward and, and you know, being personable with them. Um, turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. There's a few other minor points that I want to touch on before I close up. The, the main parts I've pretty much covered as far as our, our overall attitude, the way we present ourselves. But when we're going out and preaching the gospel, Everything is important. We need to be really paying attention to everything. Other people are looking at us, looking at what we're doing. Um, people might be watching you walk up the street or whatever. And, and this is the way things are done here. And you know what? If you say, Pastor Berzins, I don't agree with you on this. Well, if you're going to go out soloing with us, this is the way we're going to do things. Uh, and I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me anyways. But um, one is being respectful of a person's property. Okay. That means not just walking right through the middle of their yards, right? Just walking up. They got, they got their front window there, and you're just walking right, right through them and just not, you know. When, when we go soul winning here, 
You ought to be walking up the sidewalk or the driveway down to the street and coming back up again. Okay? There's a few instances where they might be extremely close together and it's not intrusive and it's not rude and you're not just like not caring about, about their space and their property. I get that. I'm not talking about the, the rare exceptions. In general, though, the rule is going to be when we go out soul winning, let's, you know, nobody wants people just traipsing across the front in the middle of their yard. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want someone walking right up in front of my front room windows because they're going from house to house and just, just cutting right through. I, that would, that would kind of irritate me. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that we care about the person inside. Maybe the person cares, maybe they don't. But I don't want the person to care about that and then not want to talk to me at all because I just ticked them off because I'm walking through their yard. Right. Be respectful of the person's property. You know, don't be kicking rocks and throwing stuff, kicking stuff to the side, whatever. Just general disregard. And be respectful of a person's children. You got someone who has children playing in the front yard, right? They're playing on their driveway. They're, they're, at, they're, they're at their house or they're right in front of their house. When you come across young children, ask them to speak to their parents if you're going to talk to them at all. Nobody is going to want you just approaching. Now look, I know that you have the gospel. I know that you have the truth. But I'm also a parent. And we don't want to be turning the parents away because you're out there talking to their children unadvisedly. Okay? I mean, that... That could get you killed of <laughs> some people. And, that's, and I don't think it's right. I would be furious if some Jehovah's Witness or some, uh, and some, some other, you know, people who believe something else were outside talking to my children as they're riding their bikes on my driveway. Don't do it. We're going we're gonna to go. You say, hey, is your parents home? Talk to the parents. And if they don't want to talk, ask them, hey, can I... Can I tell your, your children about Jesus, right? And that's fine. You want to reach the children. But do it respectfully and do it the right way. And the, the one situation, if, if the parents aren't home and the child's old enough to, to kind of be, to understand what the parents' rules would be, what I'll do is I'll say, hey, do you want to hear this? And would your parents be okay with it? Are your parents, you know, if, they, if your parents tell you not to talk to people or whatever, then just let it go. We could come back to that house later to talk to the parents or make sure that it's okay. You don't, we don't want to be getting this, you know, because here's the other thing. We are, you're not only representing, you know, being an ambassador for Christ, but you're representing our church too. This is kind of a smaller community. We're going to be around, Lord willing, for a very long time. We don't want to just get this, this uh, name that watch out for those guys, they're going after your children. We don't want to have that, that type of you know, association as, as we're just you know, like, almost like a predator going after people's kids when, when they're not letting the parents know and trying to be sneaky about it, stuff like that. We don't want to have anything to do with that. We're going to avoid all appearance of evil. Amen. Now, I love the kids too, but there's right ways and wrong ways. Now, if kids are just out and they're out at the park and their parents just, they're not watching over them, and they're just doing, you know, off and doing whatever, and they're leaving them off to the world, that's a different story. I mean, they're just, they're just out there. Go ahead. Talk to them. I mean, what, what, I don't see what a parent's going to expect. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just leave my kids to go run off and just, you know, how are you going to be angry if someone starts talking to them when they're just off by themselves? But when they're at their house and, and, you know, and, and their property, do it, do it the right way. And then be respectful of the person's own wishes too. So like you, you talk to a adult, you talk to someone there. If they don't want to talk to you, then leave. <laughs> right? That should be common sense. But we're, we don't need to cram anything down people's throats. We're not there just, you know. It, it's nice to, to be zealous and to want to preach, you know, and want to explain to people. But if they're not willing to listen, they're not going to receive the gospel anyway. So don't waste your time with that. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, yes? Look at verse number 17. The Bible reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So he brings up this term reconciliation, reconciliation many times. Being reconciled means that you've got an issue. You've got a sin problem. You've got a problem with God because of your sin. We need to be reconciled with God. We need to make things right with God. That's what the reconciliation is that he's talking about. We did something wrong. We're not in good standing. We need to do something to make things right with God. And the way that we make things right, of course, is by accepting the, the payment that Jesus Christ made for us, his righteousness being imputed unto us, and the forgiveness of our sins being received through the blood of Jesus Christ and his payment that he made for us. That is the reconciliation being referred to here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And what he's saying is that that has been committed unto us. In verse 18, he hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Ministry is when you minister. You're being a servant to somebody else. That's what a minister does. You're ministering to them, serving them, going to them. We are bringing the gospel of reconciliation, saying, hey, you're a sinner. I know that because we're all sinners. You've got a problem with God. This ministry has been given unto me. I need to show you this. I need to show you how you can be right with God again. You can be saved. You can be forgiven of all of your sins. That ministry has been given to us. This is what this, this passage is talking about here. He's committed that unto us. And since Christ is no longer walking around on this earth, he's not doing it personally He's given us that job, so we are ambassadors for Christ. Since Christ isn't standing here right now, since Christ isn't going to be going out this afternoon and knocking on doors physically, we need to be doing that. We are representing him, because that's what an ambassador does. An ambassador represents somebody else. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are representing Jesus Christ. We're saying, hey, we're here. We want you to be reconciled unto God. And um, in, since Christ isn't here, literally, I'm here to help you be reconciled unto God. That is what has been given to us. We are representing Jesus Christ when we go out soul winning. Let that sink in. You are representing Jesus Christ at every door, every person you approach, every time you talk to someone, you're bringing up the gospel. You are a representative of Jesus Christ. So like I was saying about you know, being respectful of people's houses, being respectful of their property, hey, you're representing Jesus Christ. Do you want to, to bring a bad name on Jesus Christ? Do you want people just getting irritated and aggravated over those little things? No. I mean, if they get irritated at what you're saying, the problem's with God if you're preaching his words, right? They're getting angry at, at him. Don't let them get angry at the representative, though. Because of something that you do that's not in Scripture. Where you're just, just being obtuse. And if you're being a representative, think about this now. We ought to probably be dressed decently, right? Now, I, I encourage everyone to go out soul winning and, and get out soul winning, right? It's better to go out soul winning in tattered clothing than not go soul winning at all. But if we're going to be representative, we ought to be doing our best to be the best representative that we can. Right? I mean, it only makes sense. So these are principles. I'm not saying it's a sin to go out in a t-shirt and shorts and, you know, and, and preach the gospel. Hey, preach the gospel. But let's, when, we're, when we're doing this, let's pay attention to everything. Let's pay attention to being a good ambassador, being a good minister, and let's reach people. Now, if reaching people means... You know, being like them in a certain area and it's not sinful. Okay, I could see that too. That's fine. But keep all of this in consideration of who you're representing. Even, even with things, because you're not just representing Jesus Christ, you're representing our church as well. Even something as small as how you leave an invitation in the door. Don't just sloppily throw it around, crumple it up, you know, like, at least make it look not, I mean, 
Have it straight. Have it not upside down. You know, and you say, passive versions, these things are so little. Yeah, I want to be as, as, as close as possible, the best representative I can be. Okay? And am I going to be angry with you if you turn the thing upside down? and foot? No, I'm not going to be angry with you. I'm just, we're trying to do the best that we can because I want the standard to be really high. I want our standard to be really high of, of how we go soul winning, how we approach everything, and pay attention to all the details. Let's get the basics down for sure, but let's get way past the basics, man. I want, to, I want this to be, we want to be a soul winning powerhouse, soul winning machine, and we're doing things very effectively and very efficiently. And where the name that we can bring, the glory that we could be, bring to God would be people in the community know, hey, Word of Truth Baptist Church, they're polite, they're respectful, they're bold, they're not going to be pushed around, but they're very personable and, and you know, we don't have problems with them. They've all, you know, we're not just going out and getting fights with people. We're bringing the gospel, we're doing our job, but we're respectable. That's the type of, of soul winning attitude that our church should have. And even go to one last point here, I, I, I kind of skipped over this. Conversations with your soul winning partner. I love talking to a soul winning partner. We talk all the time when we go out. When you approach someone's door though, don't be having some loud conversation where they could just like hear that you're just talking to each other at the front door. You're going to talk, I would keep it really quiet, I mean, to a whisper when you're at that door because you're going to be focused on talking to them anyways. And um, you, know, you knock on their door, but, but get into serious mode. There's plenty of time to, to talk in between the doors and, you know, again, quiet it down when you, when you kind of get up there. But it's being professional, it's being, you know, uh, focused on what you're doing and, and making people... Um, just feel like they're being respected at their house. You're not just showing up with some big, you know, like they've got something else going on inside, whatever. And, and you hear all of a sudden there's people just standing around talking at your front door. That's a little weird. So um, hopefully this helps you. I don't know. Um, we want to improve our soul winning efforts, for sure. We want, we want to become the best soul winners we can. Think about these things. Think about how you can improve your own personal soul winning. When you're going out today, think about who you're approaching, who you're talking to, what is their attitude like, how can you, can you reach that person better individually and different types of people. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the wisdom found in your word. God, I pray that you please stir up our spirits so that we would all be soul winners, that we could all get started. If we, if, if, uh, for the people here that, that maybe don't, uh, preach the gospel very much or very often or maybe even haven't at all lord i pray that you please stir up your spirit to to get started to become a silent partner to go out with us to try to learn to to improve to uh be able to to preach the gospel themselves dear lord and if there's people that aren't very comfortable with it yet like i was for for a long time for many months even years dear lord i pray that you would please um help them to continue to grow to to have boldness dear lord i pray that you would increase all of our boldness to be willing to breach the subject. And um, also, dear God, that we would um, help us to become more comfortable and, um, and have more, be more personable with people and be respectful when we go out and talk to people, dear Lord, that, that at least um, we could be representing you to the best of our ability, dear Lord. Help us to, to understand how we can do that and show us where we're in error, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.